never done anything like this before. I, I, to be fair, I think she needs a round of applause because she's yeah. awesome. <laughs> Very sort of gentle and slightly rabbit in headlights ish. Would that be a fair comment? I think so. I've just walked back in for the last event of the day and she's gone, right, you're going to walk around, you're going to do that, 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 and that, you're going to carry two microphones, and I just test one. I said, well, that's changed in 24 hours, isn't it? So, so she's definitely a. I think what I've learned is some people need more management than other people. Oh, I think that's. <laughs> but it's amazing to me that you, that you know that before I turned up. But anyway, so yeah. it takes me off my feet for this last session. You sit down. Adam is going to be the person running around and taking all the questions. So that's there you go. Take your feet, Francis. <laughs> yeah, take the time. Right, so. So hands up anyone who has a question. Here we go. Here we go. Nice and close to you. Yep, yeah, we've just bought a form here, just a very small one. Always wanted one. What's the best way to look after it? We got that just bought a form here. Yeah, small one. Always wanted one. What's the best way to look after it? In the conditions that it lives in normally, which is Spain, Lanzarote, Tenerife, it loves the sun, it has dry So you say, just move, John. Yeah, um, meet me out there in December. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, of course, it off Charlie. Now, down in the door of the village, they are absolutely lovely. They're not totally frost smiley, so you need to keep it in a reasonably frost free location. So please it off in the winter or and, and it would perform for you. It loves warm walls and, and give it those sort of conditions. Occasionally feed it. Now it doesn't need a lot of pruning. Don't over give it nitrogen otherwise it will go to growth. It benefits from the sun. And surprisingly enough, it, I've known Charlie for about 40 years and this is his last show so you've done the right thing by mm. the food there. It also means if you kill it, you ain't getting that one. <laughs> so, uh, Francis? I really can't ask that. I think just give it as much water as you can. Do you have a greenhouse? We do have a greenhouse which is not heated. It does get quite cold in the winter. However, we've got a small conservatory plastic one on the back of the house. Yeah, that's warmer. Well, we can't really go with the conservatory, but you can, probably, you can probably get away with it in the old heater's greenhouse. Um, I have my greenhouse doesn't get any light, of any sunlight in the middle of winter. So if you have that sort of position and it's quite chilly, you might want to add a little bit of extra protection with some, it's not very environmentally friendly, but some bubble wrap that you can then reuse each year. Or you can do what I did and get a load of old windows and doors and make something makeshift. It doesn't have to be a big greenhouse. I've done this every year before that with them. Um, what I used to do was put all my Pelagonian in between two raised beds and then I got my friend when he moved out and got rid of some glass doors and he gave me them, which are now on my greenhouse. But I would put them in between the two raised beds or over the top of the gap, if that makes sense, yeah. and then just stapled some bubble wrap to the end. So you can just create a little warm snug for them, which is temporary and you take it apart in the spring if you don't have a greenhouse. It does sound slightly easier maybe just to sell your house and move to Spain. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would do. <laughs> You did well, that lovely yeah. recycling event at Birmingham, didn't you? And, and it really job, job, but not your turn now. <laughs> but, oh, excuse me. <laughs> Adam, Adam's in charge. And um, all I would say to you is um, put your feet up and have a mini tone next to it. There you go. See, so that's probably the best for your prize. Right, there we go. Let's go around here. There's a lady right in front of you there, Adam, as well, that has her hand up right at the beginning. Oh, it's not telling right. you what to do. See what I mean? Oh, right, nice. Right. So, what she said. So, we got that yesterday. What's the best way to get rid of brown danger? And the other thing is, can we sleep more of ash on the tea? Right. What's the best way to get rid of brown danger? Eat it. Yeah. It's edible. Oh, okay. It's edible. Um, you can weaken it by pulling it or chopping it off at the level of the soil. Or you can cover it with cardboard and a thick layer of mulch, and that might help. But I often find that it's been very much about kind of trying to fight what we've got in the garden. You can kind of work with it and around it and just tame it a little bit. But since some of it is actually beneficial, and yeah, trying to eat it. Thank you. 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 Thank
there between us and the prevailing wind. So the rain will be coming in. So your fence, likewise, what way does the fence, you said the, the back of it is south west of it, so... We're on the other side, on the north east of north it. Yeah. So actually we're talking about things that would be on the same side even in the feeding chain. So, any suggestions? Is it a new fence? Not that new. Okay, I mean, you might not like what I'm going to say, but I think remove the fence and put a native hedge in, which would be much, much better. Not my fence. Not your fence. You like your fence. No, 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 It's a nightmare at night. 
No, 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 yeah, so I can't make my stasis. I think Solidago is good, Golden Rod. And, and probably um, I'd, I'd go for an apple tree, because that's a perennial, you see. Woody perennial. Uh, it's it's a tree, one's yeah. going vegetables, one's going woody perennials. Come on, go, just blow them out of the water. Okay, this, is, this panics me, the thought of only being able to grow three perennials for the rest of my life. So therefore, I would grow chamomile to calm me down. I would grow lavender because I always need to sleep rather than having nightmares. And I'd grow peonies just because I love them. There you go. Brilliant. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well, Adam. Go on. Do you what? need to know what three you're going to grow for the rest of your life? You're not escaping. Yeah, I was moving on anyway. I was moving on. Um, I, to be fair, do you know what? I'm, I'm done with it. I, if I can only grow three plants for the rest of my life, there's no point. <laughs> there you go, that's that one soon. There you go, my dear. I, uh, I grew three um, uh, fruit trees, uh, sort of fan arrangement on the door neighbour's fence, and uh, the, the cooking apple um, really hasn't done very well at all. And then this spring, the other fruit trees flowered, that one didn't even grow a leaf. Now it's grown leaves and no flowers. So do I just dig it up? What am I going to do? Cool, so did you hear that one? About three different fruit trees that are on the fence. Yeah. Are they fanged? Are they cordoned? Well, they were meant to be, um, uh, they've ended up fanged. They've ended up fanged. And did we know the other varieties? We said one cooker. Well, there was a pear. A pear. And, uh, and a James Green. Right, James Green, the cooker, and a pear growing on a fence. Not really doing that well. Well, particularly the cooker. And I'm just wondering, it has no flowers, so there aren't going to be an awful lot of apples. So, do I just give up on it or give it another year? Is it could it come back from this? It will probably come back down down on the uh, festival veg garden down there. There are some beautiful fruit trees from Frank Matthews, and we prune them so that they're. There's some really interesting pruning. Has anybody seen it? There's some wonderful pruning techniques down there. What you need to do, and, and I'm serious about this, we can spend all night talking about this, get a copy of the fruit garden displayed, and that will teach you the difference between a flower bird and a fruit bird, and have a look at the pruning. And if you can prune, you will get birds that will develop in their second year, which will give flowers. It's probably, have you been pruning it? How long has it been in there? It's been in there eight years. And have you been pruning it? Well, I need, I need to keep the shape of it. When, yeah, then, when do you prune? Um, I think usually in the winter. Right, there we go. A little, little bit of summer pruning if yeah. you can. Fruit garden display, look up summer pruning and give it a good feed and I think it'll work for you. Okay. Cool. Thank Francis? You. Yeah, I mean, there's a general rule with fruits, um, or a general rule I think, with anything. Um, winter pruning promotes extra growth. And summer pruning restricts the growth. And what you want with a fruit tree is you want to have fruiting spurs, which are the short, fat ones. And you look against the kind of framework, you see kind of knobbly little shoots of, of wood. That's the fruit. So you want to keep them. And then the water shoots, which are the very long, vigorous shoots with lots of leaves on, you don't want them. So you take them off in the summer and cut yeah. them down to about four buds. Yeah, yeah. And that will hopefully then give you spurs for next year. So it's about Re reducing the growth and reducing the vigour by summer pruning. Yeah, and most of that, Francis Sandin says, most of that, um, our sort of controlled fruit with, with the trees will tend to do a summer pruning and that they tend to perform. But also give them a good feed, give them a mulch, and then hopefully they'll go up. So, did you want to have anything done or? I was just going to say, add mulch after you prune so it can retain the moisture and feed it. And, and don't give up, they want to grow. So, I hope you do get flowers. Exactly. Hello. Is there a plant in your garden that you wish you'd never planted? <laughs> right, did we hear that? Is there a plant in your garden you wish you never planted? Well, if your wife's joint is ground up, because yeah. you've already said that. Yeah. 
So, any others? Uh, yeah, I think probably keep things as natural as you can, keep things as native, and don't introduce introduce species around the edge of the garden because it's in the countryside. That's my garden. No, well, no but if go back, it's going to be. Yeah, he's not really listening. Is, he? <laughs> is there anything you've introduced to your garden that you wish you'd never planted? Not really, no. <laughs> well, there we go. Not really, no. no there we go. Francis, is there anything you've ever planted in the garden you wish you'd never planted? Yes. <laughs> good, good. Can you maybe get you a bit of detail? That would be fantastic. Yes. Um, so I was given a couple of plants, I bought a couple of plants, um, one which is uh, a perennial buckwheat. I've not planted it because I hear it's incredibly invasive. And another one, which is an edible perennial that grows in deep and shade called Ditanda. Don't plant that. Just don't plant that. The whole garden will be that. And it's impossible to get rid of it. But the worst one, the one I feel the most guilty about, is what I gave my mum when I was an apprentice, called Winter Heliotrope. Petophytes. Anyone seen that? It's all over the countryside. And my old boss gave me a pot of it and said, there you go, that would be really nice in your mum's garden. It was a lovely smell in the winter. And I, she planted it and she is still, 15 years later, trying to get rid of it. I feel so bad about it. It's incredibly invasive, but it does herald spring, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Positive. Yes, yes, I'll tell my mum that. Go on, come on, you tell us. Um, no, I don't, because my garden is unsurprisingly very organised. Um, but I do really wish that the person before me didn't plant mint, because even after many years, I am still pulling that up everywhere. Yes, yeah, sure. Many yeah, exactly. That's perfect. Well, there's plenty of those. Yeah, there's yeah. plenty of many There we go. Would you, you want me? Hello, hello, John. Um, yeah, I think I've my question is, I'm interested in unusual edibles, the plants when we get in, they have to be practical and beautiful. Um, I'm struggling to find any, like, example gardens I can visit that have that criteria rather than just being it's very beautiful or it's traditional looking veggies or whatever. So the tree specimens they've got here are fantastic, but where will I see them? You know, they've got just huge examples of it. So many. Have you been on holiday recently? Not so much. Well. Maybe it's time to go to France. Um, Potager Garden, which is a classic traditional French style of gardening, which is the garden that is all edible, but it's all planted for beauty, so it's not all in line. They can be quite symmetrical, almost like not garden looking spaces, but um, they are designed that their whole remit is to be beautiful and productive. Um, but there's also a garden up in um, Scotland called Cambo, up in Fife. That's a really, it's got a lovely potager in it, and it's also got lots of. Um, Fairy planting around it. And then a garden we were all talking about last night was um, it, it's not a garden, but if you're interested in edibles and you want to sort of push the boundaries on edible growing, Martin Crawford's um, Agroforestry Research Centre in Devon, you have to go. And he does, he leads all the tours as well. He's one of those people who scares me because he doesn't talk very much and so I just feel all the silence very bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, just, just try and channel your people in a self. Um, but it's so amazing and all of the stuff, a lot of it's familiar garden plants that produce fruits that I didn't realise were edible, but he grows it in this sort of forest setting and he's got different I examples of how you can apply that in a, in a garden. So any of those three are, one being France, <laughs> any of those, yeah. Go on. And I would add to that to visit some community gardens locally to you, because you will find that many community gardens grow some really unusual plants. You know, inviting different members of the community in from other countries and then trying to, you know, get them to be inclusive, in, you know, in where they're living. I, I work in one and we grow all kinds of different edibles. And like, you know, quinoa, we were talking about earlier about callaloo, that kind of thing, all kinds of different stuff. So you, you'll find some things there that you, you will never have heard of or seen anywhere else. And the same thing happens on allotment plots sometimes. And some allotments, you know, are, are given to communities and, and they grow some absolutely incredible stuff. We have a Jamaican allotment plot um, on our site and it, it, I mean, it looks phenomenal. Some of the stuff growing on there is absolutely incredible. Different spices and peppers, all kinds of things. So have a look locally as well, like community and allotment plots, definitely. Come on in, Lord. 
there's a revolution going on in gardening and it's about edible plants. I don't plant any plants in my garden designs now. I've definitely got some that are not good to look at. They've got to be good to look at. They've got to grow well in the soil, so right plant, right place. And if you can, get it edible. The pig restaurant chain, um, I've worked with Hugh Burley, Whitting Stall, and, and uh, they're all doing it, all the great chefs. We just done one in Kew Magnum called the Birmingham Trap. And it's all edibles, so it's happening everywhere. Uh, quinoa. I went to the great restaurant, uh, sorry, they sell uh, seeds and things like that. I got my quinoa from there, and very few people know that plant, but that's the sixth most important cereal crop in the world now. And you can grow it, you can grow it at home. I've grown it, it's drought tolerant, you barely have to do a thing. You sow it, it grows, you harvest it, it's wonderful. Well, I think also just grow it, I'm loving it. Well, I'm here for Propagation Place, actually. So I work for a nursery, which is yeah. a community garden at the allotment. And we, we have a tree spinach here, which grows six foot, yeah. and everyone goes nuts for it. And it, it's like goose foot that people pull up out of their garden. So I'm a big campaigner for like, eating your weed. Yeah, I love that. I, I actually got some uh, perennial broccoli and some perennial kale from Propagation Place, and it's grown absolutely wonderfully well. It, it's perfect. Yeah, if you haven't heard of perennial veg, go for that as well. Yeah. Definitely. All right, good, good, good. Right, let's go up this side here. Let's have a look. Here we go. How are we doing for time, boss? Um, you've got. Oh, this is not. How are we doing? Ten minutes. Well, maybe no, a bit under. A bit under ten minutes. Well, that's why you were going to try that. Go on, you can fill your books. Go on. Right, okay. Uh, yeah. um, I've got a question. I'm trying to go. It's, it's cold in that book, isn't it? Where they're going out. Okay. So. It's a Worcester. Um, I've got two tiers, um, and I'm trying to make it go up the next one. So I've cut off the leader, and I've got up the second tier, but I, it's not making any buds to go straight up again. So what can I do to encourage it? So you're, you're talking about a Oh, Sorry, yeah, 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 yeah sure. Yeah. Um, it's tricky. <laughs> you've, you've cut off the leader. I, yeah, but which. Is not really advisable because what you would do, if you if you hadn't done that, is you let the leader grow tall. Yeah. What tends to happen is something called apical dominance, which is that yeah. leader wanting to go up, yeah. and all the branches below that are inhibited. Yeah. The further away from that, there's less inhibition, so they'll grow more vigorously. So you let that leader grow up until it's as tall as you want the final apple oh, to you be. Okay. Then you cut it. And then you break the inhibition below so that the, the laterals below start to grow and then you train them to become um, horizontal. It's just that one of the books I read actually said you cut off that and then you should get a bug which will continue on up, but it hasn't. No, that's it. That's not working. It's worked with a pair, but not oh, this one. But you just can't predict where the next buds will form. It will want to get apical dominance again and you'll probably find a bud will form somewhere at the yeah. point. I will get vigorous at all. Yeah. It may not be quite in the centre no, to give you yeah. that. I've tried nicking um, above a bud, which is not in the centre, but that hasn't produced anything. So. Anyone else got any? Yeah, yeah very yeah. simply. Look down the shoot, right? So, in other words, you get the shoot that you're going to prune first. Yeah. You look down that shoot, and you will find there's a bud going in different directions. The ninth bud down starts to repeat it. So if you want to go west, you prune to that bird. If you want to go east, you prune to that bird. And it's really a question of looking down the shoe, finding the bird on the position in the direction you want to take it, and prune to that bird. It is really simple, and that applies to all pruning. You look down the shoe from the top. The apical bird is up at the top. If you want to encourage one of the others further down, then you prune to that one. That becomes a equitable bird and it will go in that direction. It is so simple, it's not true. And it's not in any of the books. <laughs> well, are we, are we that? Are we, yeah, you can prune apple tree branches in circles if you go to the inward growing bird all the way around. Is, is that helped? Yeah, I don't think I'm to work on well, I think, I think they would, you know, they would try and make that point really politely, but, um, yes, there you go. There you go. Did you want a question? Good job, we can't hear up here. <laughs> That's where you get rid of bamboo. Yeah. 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 Right, there we go. Best way to get rid of bamboo in the garden. JCB. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There you go. Any, any big sort of smaller? Come out soon. <laughs> Has it spread quite a lot already? Very big. It's very big. Um, just, before, just before I say, um, we, we did have to dig out a massive bamboo in our back garden. Um, and it took a lot of work, uh, a lot of painful backaches, because it was popping up in the next door neighbour's garden. And the shoots that were coming up next door were enormous. It was incredible. So really, it's about digging it all out and getting every single little bit you can. And if you want to plant bamboo, use a, a root, like a container, a bamboo um, sheeting or something, because they do run right. Um, but to me, I, I would have to just dig it all out if you want to. Or, or you can just take some out and manage it over time, so you can make it a little bit smaller. Um, but ultimately, it's a dig it up job to me. Francis, anything else? Thank you very much. Hold on, Miss Francis is going to see if she can work some magic for you. I can't make it easier for you, but um, again, uh, talking about Martin Crawford, it's edible. Bamboo shoots. So one way that you can manage it is when you see the, 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 the suckers sort of spreading and coming up, dig them out, but then you can eat them. So every year you'll sort of do a big, a big clearance around it to keep it contained, and then you'll have a crop as well. Or buy yourself a pound of beer or something. Yeah. 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 So I think we've got time yeah. for one we've more got one question. more. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to push right over there. I'm going to, I'm going to drag this out. Do I'm going to go, where are you hiding? What are you hiding behind? What is it? What have you got? Is it a table or is it a... Oh, I still can't work out what it is. Oh, I'll put shells on it so I can't so... Oh, that's quite interesting, isn't it? It's a bargain. Well, it's only a bargain if you actually wanted it. But there you go. There you go, Alice. Go on, right. Pull your boots. Hi. You're one to the up there. How, how easy is it to grow and maintain a chamomile lawn? Oh, here we go. Go on. Um, it's a little bit harder than you might be led to believe. But it is very hard. Hold on, hold on. It was one of your only three plants. So don't go back on it now. Cause you... <laughs> So come on, how old are you? I didn't say I was growing a chamomile lawn. Oh, well, 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 you, you would have to because you only have three plants to grow, so you've got to wax your ear about this plant now. Come on. I do love chamomile, and you can grow a chamomile lawn. Um, you want to really make sure that you're not walking on it all of the time, and you know, or having anyone kick balls on it all of the time, and they're a little bit less tolerant, you know, than than general grass. Can you levitate? Yeah, no. walk, walk on it barefoot and lay on it and ground yourself on it, you know, and prune the flowers and have tea and everything. Really, to be honest with you, it's just about maintaining it the same as you would a chamomile if it was just one or, or two. And um, they are generally very easy to maintain as long as you are not walking on it heavy all of the time. Um, they, you will find after maybe two or three years, some of the plants do get a little bit kind of browny, and you might have to replace them. Um, but and, and it's not Roman chamomile that you plant for the lawn, is it? I think it's the other chamomile that you plant for the lawn. It is, yeah. So Roman chamomile is what you might generally find around, and you would have in your tea. But there's a different chamomile, and that's the one that's recommended to grow the lawn. I can't remember the name. German. Remember the name of it? It's a different one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. German, no, no, there is a different one that's recommended to, to grow for a lawn. It's not necessarily a Roman one. Um, um, but you can, and it's wonderful, and it's awesome for pollinators, and it will smell delightful, it's useful. Just imagine walking out in the morning with bare feet, having a cup of tea, absolutely awesome. Um, but just get the right chamomile, which ne the name I can't remember. Well, are we going to add anything? So yeah, the, key, the keys in the preparation, make sure it's as weekly as possible. Um, we managed one on a neighbour's property and it was brilliant because Susie used sterilised soil to begin with, with grit in it. And the other thing is get a really sharp pen knife and as soon as you see other weeds come up, just tease them out because that's the key to good chamomile lawn management. Grit, sterilised soil to begin with, if you can afford it and then look at it every day and get rid of any small weeds that come out. Yeah, completely, like well-drained is 100% what you need. Do you know what soil you have? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Is that you, you, just what you want to grow? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. first class to say, Astrid, uh, that you might. Oh, say, uh, you're going to get attacked up there for saying that. I'm only teasing you, know that. I had an attempt at growing a camel online last year because it was a little organisation called the BBC rocked up in my garden when it was pouring with rain. And they sent a lot of people to come and film, and the, the lawn, the tiny lawn, <laughs> got completely trashed two times. And on the second time, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to try and grow a lawn anymore. I'm going to grow something else. So I planted some chamomile. Um, I'm not on a clay soil, but I am in Devon, and it rains a lot. And it lasted for about two months before it just sort of disappeared. So um, what I would say instead is some other creeping plants, so something like Spelt Heel. That's a lovely plant that will grow in a similar way. It's a herb, so if you wanted to use it for medicinal reasons, as chamomile can be used, um, you can, but it will be much more tolerant to sort of wetter conditions and shadier conditions than the chamomile. And again, just like Ellen said, you can't walk on it as much as you would on grass, but it often grows in long anyway. You can actually know it, because if it's growing in amongst your grass, it will flower little purple flowers right down at the ground, or we can let it get a little bit bigger and it'll get, you know, six, seven inches high. Or even things like violets, little native dog violets that will grow through instead. And um, so if chamomile isn't possible on a heavy clay, then maybe something else creeping in low might do better. My clover does well actually to confirm my own that that sort of hasn't kept the clovers amazing. That's like flying. So clover. Yes, yeah, so clo clovers work really well. Clovers, where I am, is playing on the limestone bed, and, and I put down an unkept lawn, so it's got grass species in it. But last year, the plant probably did the best out of all of those, I would say, was the clover. Have you, um, have you seen the show garden over there um, by Laura Ashton Phillips with the clover lawn? Yeah, it's a it is absolutely beautiful. It looks really wonderful. She had some children on there the other day, and they all found all these clovers as well. That's a joy. Yeah, really lovely. But uh, you know, if you can't have the clover lawn, you could always grow it in like a low pot. So you could just sit, have a cup of tea, and put your feet on the pot. Have it that way. Yeah, there There's also a lovely little mint called Mentha pumila, which is a new plant. You never finished learning in this job. And I got some the other day, and I'm going to make a lawn out of that, and really will grow on a clay soil with a bit of gravel in it. So anyway, next year when we come back and there'll be one plant you don't want to plant in the garden, <laughs> that's the one John will be talking about. You can pretty much guarantee it. And because you're the feed his wife off. And anyway, I think that is it as you said, isn't it? So I think now, because you're in charge, so I don't want to like presume I think now you should No, you should now get up because you're the boss lady. And you should do now and then we can do all the frank here. Can you come and sit down? I come and sit down like a good little boy. But if I can get back up there, I'll tell you, ooh, <laughs> oh, right, right. Well, right. everybody who asked a question, don't forget at the end, go and get a prize. Um, but thank you very much to Pete, who's on the sound, who's been here all week and super helpful. Um, so thank you, Pete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've um, been trying to keep Adam to sit to the time, but he's doing a really hard job, I think we can all agree. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you all the organisers here. This is the end of, of the, the stage here at Walden. Thank you, Ellen Mary Webster. Thank you. John Wheatley. Thank you. 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 Thank you.